Hello and welcome to the Outcast. I'm your host, HC, and with me is Wolf. And today we are back to talk about one of the greatest shows that has ever been made, Avatar The Last Airbender. This time we're here with season two, or book two, Earth, the thing we live on. Speak and for yourself, you... I don't live here. Honestly, this is the least weird thing you told me in the <laughs> eight-something years we've been doing this. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, that being said, uh, if you want uh, our thoughts about book one, you can check the previous episode for that. We talked about it last week. Now we are moving on to book two. And because this yep. is a relatively old show, and we're pretty sure that whoever listens to us has seen Avatar at some point, we are not really going to bother with like spoiler stuff. This is just going to be us talking about it freely. So yeah, I'm a book two. Like, and if you're curious, we're doing this in preparation for the live action show that's getting ready to come out in a few weeks. It'll be great, everyone, or not. And everyone, everyone is afraid of it. Trust me, everyone is fucking afraid. But uh, we'll worry. We'll worry about that bridge when we cross it. And if you're mm -hmm. wondering, we already kind of talked about the live action movie that doesn't exist in the previous episode because it basically it was basically a retelling of season one. And uh, we are not going to bring this up again. We are not going to talk about it again because there's no reason. So, with that being said, book two is it really a surprise to say that this season is just as good, if not better, than the first one? I mean, I, I would definitely say it's better, yeah. Because, I mean, it, it yeah. you already had a good season one, right? And everyone knows, like, generally season one of a show, sometimes it's not as good as what comes after because it's mostly setting up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that still holds true here, but you had such a strong season one. They had a lot to live up to, and I think they did very well. Oh, very well. Like, talk about just not only continuing the story, but also just knowing exactly what to how to up the ante like at just the right moment and you know mm -hmm. going to more things like explaining more of the avatar state and also and glenn in earth which you know this is such a weird thing for me because i remember as when i first watched this i was thinking oh okay cool he's gonna learn earth bending in this season you know obviously it's called book two earth but it's not until they come on to it that i that i thought you know what? Yeah, the Avatar would probably have a lot of trouble, you know, mastering the element that's opposed to his uh, to his original one. And then I, mm -hmm. I so, it, I, and because I never really thought about that. And then it's like they bring the sound that Ang obviously would have problem with Earthbending because you know he's an Earthbender, so of course he would have well, a problem with that. It's interesting like, because they don't necessarily tie it to the bending; they tie it to like that person's personality more than anything because Korra has trouble with water bending or well, air bending Cora right and Cora didn't exist well, back then so no but what I mean by... though is like I mean you can still see that it's more tied to Aang's personality than it is to his um like he's, him being feel, an airbender and it's all and I think it also kind of comes down to the fact that you know uh, Aang is a lot more spiritual um, in this idea so obviously he's so he follows more of the you know or like the spiritual way of things and you know mm -hmm. Korra was less spiritual so maybe that also has something to do with it it's that's also kind of possible yeah I mean, I mean that's fair that's like a, a a fair assessment yeah but to be fair it was just one of those moments where where like they talk about this and it's like you know i never even thought about that but that's really interesting and also but all but at the same time he still manages to get earth bending relatively well. Like even if he's not a master of it, he can. Tr you know, he still does great by it, and you can also see that it serves them as the season goes on. Like, mm -hmm. it, like it's not like with Katara with the uh, the water bending. That's kind of like, okay. He learned some, and then Katara will like kind of pick up the slack. In the no, like uh, he learns it and kind of sticks with him. So I think it's really cool. And I also like that despite him, you know, being essentially a monk, you can see him getting a lot more emotional this time around. He's a lot, especially because the Avatar State does relate to it. And mm -hmm. you see him through pain. You see him through... There's a very short moment. Yeah, I think it's in the same episode where Toph starts uh, teaching him more, uh, re you know, more regularly. That he tries to meditate and everyone and everyone is uh, bothering him and he tells... 
so when Katara comes in to tell him that Sokka has been gone and he tells her, I made it, I, I made it, I didn't hear, like, it's, like, it's this thing that you, you see this jolly little kid and you see, yeah, he can get angry. He can get frustrated. That's, he, everyone just feels more alive this mm-hmm. season. But so I've been, I will yeah. say, mm-hmm. I don't think Aang, Katara, Sokka, and eventually Toph are our big focus this season, in my opinion. I think oh, this season no. is definitely stolen by two other people. Or three other people, mm-hmm. technically, I suppose you could say. Mm-hmm. And I think one of them starts with a Z. Yes. Zuko has a lot going on this season. As does Let's... Iroh as his uh, support. But yeah, Zuko is, I, am I think, just going the to star say... of this season, in my opinion. Yeah. It, he go uh, honestly because he's the one that goes through his story goes in so many directions and all of them are interesting and yes. i was about to say zuko alone is probably one of the best episodes of the show no i i agree like it, it's definitely up there okay you know what i have to do because zuko alone is one of those episodes that like captures everything it tries to do perfectly Mm. And and it also like and it also annoys me to some degree because there are movies that can get this level of emotion done with this story in two hours, and this one nails it in twenty two minutes. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, and like all the flashbacks, all, and like at the end when he saves the kid and he tells them, "I want you to," and the kid tells him, "No, go away, I hate you." After this entire, like. Fuck, man, that hurts. That fucking hurts. You agree with me, right? Mm-hmm. I'm letting you go, so, man. I was letting you run with it. Uh, okay, uh, so you know, and I'm <laughs> I don't so, disagree. And, you know, it, okay, uh, and then, and you know, just this. I uh, for one, it's also it's not the first time I've seen at least in anime I've seen this done, but like in American animation. I don't recall many episodes in which the main characters just don't show up for an episode. You just get an episode for essentially the bad guy. True. At least because uh, Zuko alone is kind of early in the season, if I remember. It's like episode ep- 7. Yeah, it's episode 7. So, so like for over 20 episodes, you just see him try to get this kid and suddenly... Ang and his friends are not are not even in the episode, and it's just Zuko. You don't see any. You see a Zula in flashbacks, but uh, that's uh, about that's about it. We also need to talk about this season because this is the first time seeing her oh, as well. But we'll get there. Uh, we'll get to Azula. <laughs> Believe me, we are gonna get to Azula. But no, like I, I agree with you. Like just seeing more of the flashbacks of the family and seeing like the different family personalities, like the Fire Lord, you know Ozai, who we've really only ever seen in kind of shadow at this point, we actually get a good or a better look at him finally, right? And we get mm-hmm. to see more of what he's like, you know, kind of as a father from Zuko's past. We get to see a little bit of his mother and we get to see his uh, grandfather like briefly, right? Mm-hmm. And you start to get more of the dynamic between uh, that, you know, Zuko wasn't always angry. Like he was, a, he was kind of just a, to an extent a playful kid to some degree. Mm-hmm. And and you know you can tell that that that, that his mom disappearing was what uh, was actually something that impacted him quite badly. And you see from a very early age that Azula was a, was a little bitch. But you know there's it, it it's so interesting though to see that you know you want to you want to get this deeper flashbacks to a villain. As far, I need to state something at the time, like at the time this show came out. You barely saw that. Today, you can see a bit more of it. A lot of other shows do that today. But back in the day, this was something else. Hmm. I'm try- I don't remember anything that really went this deep into... Like, we've always had villain redemptions and everything, right? But I don't think we... I, I would agree it, if it was something that happened. I don't remember it happening often. At least, because remember, right. this came back out in 2006. For those of you yes. young whippersnappers yes. who weren't yeah, even alive to- back then. It- yeah, like it was around 2006 or something like that. And at the time, I don't remember a show like this going this deep into a villain's backstory. Like, you know, villains, maybe 
not to this degree though not to uh, not to this level it was rare right at the very least it was rare it was not something that was done super often Mm -hmm. because again like you would have the redemption stories here or there but they were very quick more often than not this was the first time where you saw a villain where where we saw a really in-depth look into a villain's life and why they were the way they were right and what Mm -hmm. what put them down the path they're currently on and you know shaped them to be who they are now yes and um, and with all that said, uh, I think Zuko alone is like really that. It, you know, Zuko alone is kind of what what the storm was for season one. We get that for uh, Zuko alone is that episode for season two, and we get it very early. Like it's not even halfway through the season; it's like at the first half of it. And I don't. I don't. I, I think I might disagree with you. I don't think that's the tone shift of the season, personally, because I would say we get that and like. For quite a little bit after that, other than, I would say, well, you have a, a the scene in the library where, you know, Appa is kidnapped, and that kind of sets up, right? A, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, but I think at this point, though, we already know the stakes. We already know that stuff is going on there. Like, uh, stuff has happened by that point. But I, I will say, for me personally, at least, I think there's a big section there after office kidnapping where the pace really slows down and it's not a bad thing but you can start to feel it after a little bit i, I think personally mm-hmm. yeah. I-, I think the the bossing say arc drags on for a little bit too long in my opinion but i will say our our two-parter finale brings it back especially well, well so. we'll get we'll get to the finale mm-hmm. but uh uh, I, I guess you know. Uh, sp- since you mentioned Basting Say, I guess uh, we kind of need to talk about this one. The tales of Basting Say, what many people kind of consider the best episode. Uh yeah. I mean, I I think Iroh's part I think is the one that people most love, right? <laughs> you know, you know what's funny about that? That I think I don't remember where I saw that, but Nickelodeon kind of had a poll. Like, you know, which uh, which uh, tale from the Tales of Basting say do like the most? And they didn't even put uh, Iowa's tale as an option, I think, because they knew people were going to vote for it. I mean, I, I think he wins in a landslide almost every time because that was yeah. the first time you saw Iroh, like, vulnerable and everything, right? Like, this dude who's mm-hmm. just been kind of old and dispensed out wisdom here or there was very carefree about everything. And finally, you get to see, like, no, there, there's a pass to that as well. Like you've been getting tidbits of it here and there, but like, there's a you know genuine he lost past someone. there too. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, he lost someone. You know that if I, and and then you know when he you see you see him like paying tribute to his uh, son that he lost. It's like fuck. And especially, it, uh, I think it also hits more home that they do like uh, the in loving memory of Mako who died. Uh, I was original mm-hmm. voice actor. Yeah, that also like ouch right in the feels. Agreed. But yeah, but yeah, tells of busting say in general because again, it kind of it, you know, it's a bunch of short stories, but you get, a, you know, you see Katara and Toph getting to bond, considering the considering they started off uh, on the wrong foot. Then mm-hmm. you just see Sokka being himself, Ang just being <laughs> Sokka being himself. Yeah. I mean, what? should should we talk about that because Sokka has quite a few different things of, and I. I I don't know if we should bring it up, but there was that recent little release on the live action thing where we're like, hey, we've toned down the sexism in Sokka's story. And it's like, uh, like you know, talking about that, because think... the Tales of Ba Sing Se has a little bit of going into that. It's not necessarily sexism, but it is more of Sokka learning, right? Because his little tale is him ending up in a girls only poetry club and yeah. actually doing well with that and learning a lot from that. Right. And mm-hmm. that's. That's kind of his entire story. Yeah, it starts out he's sexist because he is. But like the yeah. Kyoshi Warriors, this little tale right here, that's a part of his arc. Like he is flawed in that way, but he does learn and grow from it. So yeah, um, let's say I'll save, I'll, I'll reserve judgment. Oh, absolutely on what right. I'm not going to judge the live it. Live action thing. I, I'll save. It, I'll reserve judgment on the live action thing until we actually see it. And oh, absolutely. What they actually mean. But it's also, but it's also, yeah, you know, just because a character starts out flawed, and you know, because he does grow, 
he does grow from yeah. it. He does, mm-hmm. and, and like for instance, the purpose the woman he's most sexist towards ends up being his end all be all girlfriend. Yeah, what does that tell you? I mean, it, again, right? Like, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, it's perfectly fine for a character to start off flawed. Like, that's kind of the point, right? We want them flawed so that way they learn, so that way we can see how they grow and change and mature, or don't. Yep. And, depending on what kind of story you're telling, right? So mm-hmm. it, it definitely, I understand why a lot of people would be nervous about hearing that news or like outright, yeah, this show's not going to be good. As you said, I, I'm going to reserve judgment. Maybe, maybe like, you know, they blow us away. <laughs> maybe they don't, but um, it doesn't again, give that, a lot of good, that, right, you know. Yeah, it's it does kind of, you know, because it kind of gives the idea that you are missing the point in order to push an agenda. Mm-hmm. The agenda, like the agenda, shouldn't come at a, you know instead of the characters and the story. Or even if you're not pushing an agenda, right? It just it shows a misunderstanding of how to do character writing or or yeah. the character also, from the show. And again, like there's a point where if you want to push an agenda, you need you need someone in the show that doesn't. Uh, that doesn't agree with the agenda initially because you need to teach that lesson and the lesson doesn't go through if a character doesn't learn it in the day that's why certain reasons why suck for the record yeah. that you know you are trying to push a lesson here but the characters in the show refuse to learn that lesson so yeah or the lesson doesn't feel earned because it's like the character doesn't feel like they have that flaw even right 13 mm-hmm. Reasons Why has a lot of those issues, too, where we're trying to teach these people these lessons, but it's like, are you, though? Because these particular characters don't feel like they're the ones that need to learn these lessons, but... Yeah, and here, you know, sexism is bad, we all know it, but Saka kind of needs to be a sexist jerk in order to learn, and learn that he shouldn't be. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And he does. He does. He, throughout. He, he does. Not, yeah, throughout the show, and so I again will reserve judgment, but totally get what you mean. No, no, fair, fair. Mm. But getting and, back to uh, something that is definitely good, and we know for a fact is good. Yeah, tell us a bossing say I think is great. Like even you get they even give something for Momo, which is wild, but it's still fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, honestly, like I said, Momo and Appa are kind of like the MVPs of this franchise to I some think, degree. I feel like this season they do a lot more with showing like. The, the, you know, Appa and Momo having, like, more personality, right? Mm-hmm. I think something that, you know, well, like, we'll probably talk a little bit about in a bit is the library having the, yes. um, the archaeologists, the library, you know, like, Momo, co- like, having the archaeologist, like, man, I wish I could understand Appa's speech so I could talk to him and learn all the things he knows, and Momo coming up, like, trying to talk to him, the archaeologist mm-hmm. saying, hush, you know, like, oh, what does he say, like, you know, like babbling monkey or something like that. I forget. They just calls him a monkey. Yeah. Momo's like, what? <laughs> it's great. Like just yeah, seeing Momo, Momo's face. <laughs> yeah, like, and Momo's is like, a, who are you calling a monkey, you asshole? <laughs> but, or the or the swamp but, benders as well. Like seeing them try to get away from the uh, the the water benders in the swamp, right? And uh-huh. like Momo and Oppo, their little journey there. It's great. I think they yeah. do a lot more with that. Uh, no, the, really... li- the library yeah. also always breaks my heart, though, when they when they actually when they steal up. Uh, this is uh, no, mm. don't do this to up. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and you know, it's also kind of heartbreaking because you know that Toph kind of had the hard choice to make that uh, I wish no one would have to make. That mm. you know, I either save up uh, or I let the others die. Like, what's beneficial here? Well, it's even harder it's... for her too because like she can't really you know do much about it either because it's on sand and she can't really see well right and i love that they foreshadowed that so well too and even beyond that right like they even i believe if i'm not mistaken ang calls her out for it too right like he gets mad at her about it and she's like well Mm -hmm. screw you there's nothing i could do yeah right Uh, i'm not mistaken if if we are talking about tough i guess you know our introduction to the main cast uh, to an extent um mm-hmm. i i like tough tough is great no i i agree like she's definitely 
a good fit for the group because she's vastly different from everything we've seen beforehand up to that point, right? Where mm -hmm. Whereas everyone else is kind of nice and cheery and very easy to get along with and everything like that. You have Toph, well, who's very you much know, none of that. Be yeah, because you have Aang, who's like, you know, he's the... He's a goofball kid, essentially. He, you know, he wants. To, he also likes to have fun and to do all of these air tricks, and you know, he's funny. And Kata and Katala has, you know, while she's not a goofball, she's she's more like the wise person, the determined one who will fight no matter what. And and Saka is, you know, is your comic relief essentially. So it, it's only coming to Toph who. Like and she has has her funny moments, right? She's definitely have she has great comedic timing. I will and, say, yeah. I think the boulder stole her introduction episode just a little bit, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, granted, I know a lot of people make the joke. Oh man, they should have went with the boulder as as his earthbending teacher. <laughs> it would have been funny, but that joke would have gotten old very fast. But I, I it would like be the, funny. It, it was it was also like a nice curveball that you think, oh, you know, he knows Boomy, so obviously Boomy can be, you know, be a zero bending teacher. Then something like, no piece of boulder now. True. Well, it's a, it was a nice bait and switch, and then and to lead us to tough who's like, who's um, and uh, I also like, like the explanation that you know, yeah, she couldn't see, but she can see through, you know, through through the earth essentially, just feeling the ground. From her going, sense. Yeah, from her sense, and also just the yeah, and also and you know also like uh, when they explain that airbending really comes you know like the. Um, like those, I forgot what the animals are. They are not otters. I think. Oh, the um, the badger moles, I believe it is. Yes, there you go. We get so, a... uh... hmm. nothing. No, I, I, I just like you know that their emotion kind of taught her, you know, the idea of like how how to use the ground to her advantage, and mm -hmm. um, and you know I. Of course, I appreciate the fact that she's blind because, you know, it's for one, it's badass. And two, I think they managed to get a good amount of comedy out of it without uh, being the... Ha-ha, she can't see. Well, I mean, she's constantly, right, throughout this season and the next, making a joke of, oh, look, there's a thing over there. And everybody looks over there and she's just like, hello, blind, still, yeah, can't yeah. see. Like, yeah. again, like the library, right, the, in that episode mm -hmm. where she shouts out, oh, look, it's over there is what it'll sound like when one of you see it as she waves her hand in front of her blind face. Yeah. I love that she makes I, jokes like that. Yeah, because, because again, it gives... Because, yeah, I know it's a terrible thing. I want to wish it upon anyone, but it's not nice that she kind of embraces it. And I don't that, have a know, blind friend, but I, f I firmly believe, if and I'm sure people who do have blind friends can confirm, they probably will happily make jokes about that or like that to their friends that can see from like, time to time I, just to fuck I with had them. A, I had a deaf <laughs> colleague who would, have, who would occasionally make jokes about it. I'm sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is that they, uh, because there's a... Uh, shortly after Toph joins them, actually, there's, a, there's the episode where Toph and Katara get into an argument and Katara's trying to talk to her and Toph has this moment that, like, she would point to Katara's face, but she'll look in the in the in a different direction entirely. I don't know why it's so it's such a small detail, but it's so funny to me mm. that she would point in the right direction, but she won't even look at her, either intentionally or not. I don't know. It's just I, funny. It's hard to tell with Toph, right? Like, you think maybe it's an accident, but also it very could it very well could be on purpose by her too. <laughs> And it's great. Like, like, it, I love that. Mm -hmm. It's it adds to the character. Yeah, and in general, Toph is just a lot of fun, and and um, you know, she uh, of course whenever it's nice to see earth bending in this show. Like uh, when they actually have the air, you know, earth around them, at, and it becomes obviously it becomes a bit more, uh, um, you know, a bit a bit more of an occurrence to see here because you have Toph and Anglers it, and there are other Basing say soldiers using it. It's cool to see what airbending can actually do, mm -hmm. uh, because we because we didn't really see that last season, like occasionally, but not all the time. Agreed. Like it, it's definitely you get a lot more of it this season, and a lot less water bending, but that's fine because mm -hmm. the focus well, is more uh, earth bending and showing that off, right? 
you know, we still got plenty of water bending there. Oh yeah, like, no, there was, like... there was still enough. There was still plenty of that. It's a, it's just that it was interesting because. I, because last season, you know, Ang did a lot of air bending, a lot of people did a lot of water bending, and Zuko and all the Fire Nation people were doing the fire bending. Elt was kind of like pushed to the side. We didn't see much of it. So now to see that, like you know, there's the point where like there there were there were the few of them who, and they like they're like that three air bending benders who like you know flip over a fucking tank and it's like fuck, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. In, I think also that I really enjoyed the episode where and there's this drill who is about which is about to you, you know to break the wall. Oh uh, yeah, drill in, for it, yeah. And, and yeah, and it it was a really cool episode. Like it's a really really intense and really action packed, and you can see like how each element can come into its own because this is before they create a metal bending. Tough yeah. does rather. Which, by the way, talk about a powerful moment that she she manages to figure it out, and it's and it's something that you know develops, you know, when you know not to jump ahead too much, but you know when Cora comes in, metal bending becomes more common, and it's really cool mm-hmm. to see to see where it came from. And it's also really neat because the way they do it, right? Like, is the same time you have the guru talking about the avatar state to Aang and telling him like, hey. This is how everything is connected and how if someone wanted, they could do these things if they were able to do them. And it just takes like a lot of practice and an understanding of things in such a way that most people either haven't acquired yet or haven't thought about yet. Right. By the way, that there's the point when Ang goes to the guru and like the guru explains to him how to get to the avatar state. And, you know, also the if he dies in the avatar state, the cycle breaks completely and everything, and Ang went through so much, and uh, after, and you know, considering everything, and then he tells him, "Can I drink? Uh, can I have some of this uh, banana onion thing again?" And it's like, oh, you know, because he hated that first time he let him <laughs> drink that, he hated it, and so when he asked for it again, this is like when you know, fuck, this kid has been through so much. Fair. And yeah, especially with the Avatar state, I think uh, everything they do with that is really interesting to go on and explain because we saw Ang reach it a few times in the in the previous season, and now we kind of see more how much it matters to the Avatar and how much it, it just like how this is the Avatar's greatest weapon, it also puts him in a big disadvantage because if he's killed, that's it, Avatar cycle gone. Mm-hmm. And, and even more than that, right? Like him not being able to let go of certain things might also cause issues for it as well, right? Yeah, because, in... and this is another interesting thing if we're gonna talk about the differences between Ang and Korra, like, when Korra finally lands the Avatar state, she can basically go into it seamlessly. Ang still has some problems with that. Well, I mean, it's kind of <clears throat> the the difference in when we find them, right? Because Korra's already trained and learned all of these things and kind of mastered a lot of it already right the only thing we're kind of dealing with with her is airbending so the avatar state for her is a lot more viable i guess it would be the word or it's it's like you've already seen this so we're not going to go through a thing of her learning how to truly achieve it because we don't need that this time like we need this time as a vastly different type of story but again it's it's i agree with you it's interesting to see the differences between the two of them since we can now mm-hmm. compare and contrast right and the different yes. stories that go on definitely um but uh, <clears throat> but yeah everything we learn about the avatar state is really interesting and i'm trying to think we talked about zuko we don't, i mean i, I guess i would uh, like to go back to the library briefly before we move on to the uh you know our newest villain i would like to talk about the library briefly i love wan shi tong i love <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a soft spot that in my heart for him boy. <laughs> yeah, the fanboy who just wants all the knowledge and then when the place it's like, no, I have No, I mean, I'm I talking about Wan Shi Tong, the owl, the, the spirit oh, of the, the library. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. I love oh, him. that thing is fucking creepy. Yeah. I love him, though. He's great. <laughs> I love his little uh, fox assistance, everything about it. All great. All wonderful. Mm-hmm. But I also, like, re-watching this, right? Because it's been a little while, I will admit. Yes, But even then, I can still remember so much of this, again, as I said from season one, like so much of this still sticks with you. But 
I, I, I'd forgotten, right? Like we get, the, you know, the library is our first look at the lion turtles. Like it's a brief look, but you know, mm-hmm. looking back, like it is our first look at them and where we get a first little reference to them when we see them later in Avatar and even more of them in Korra as well, right? Like it's really cool to yeah. see that. Uh, like the because and um, up until this point we don't really uh, this was like we don't really know what the lion turtles do and we or still what they are know. really we just know like we've seen yeah. an image of them but we know but uh, now knowing their importance it is kind of cool to suddenly see one it's like this is this is your introduction mm-hmm. yeah like i just i think like from a side episode deal i think the library is one of my personal favorites just of a lot of the stuff it sets up and then everything that comes after it right with appa and all that i think it's one of my more personal favorites and i mean we can't forget like you know mushy mushroom later with (laughs) suck oh some of the best shit (laughs) yeah like uh And, and you know speaking of the library another kind of thing i like about it is is that I, what, again, like kind of like with how Ang would obviously have the trouble learning out bending because air, air, the differences. So it's I never really taken into account that you know if there is an eclipse, if it's gonna impact the fire benders, mm. and and uh, suddenly they're like, yeah, you know what? If there's an eclipse, yeah, the fire benders are kind of are kind of toast. Well, there was always this kind of thought, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's been a long time, but I remember back in the day seeing some of the discussion right being about like how do the firebenders firebend right like where does a lot of that come from right you know because there's because no one really understood because water you know they have water air it's all around you all the time so that makes sense and then earth well you need the earth around you and if they don't have those things then they can't do it right so everybody was if i'm not mistaken i kind of remember that discussion being like where does firebending come from where are they able to do that it makes sense right that Oh, if you block out the moon, that can disrupt, you know, water bending because of how the moon is connected to, you know, water and it being able to move and the tides and yada yada and all that. But also, mm-hmm. like, it makes sense that if you blocked out the sun, right, that would affect firebenders. That would, you know, harm them in a way and hurt their bending. I mm-hmm. like how they attach it to some of these, you know, more physical things within the world, right? Yeah. It doesn't make um, it just feel so, like it's magic that comes out of nowhere. There's there's a grounding to it. There's an understanding to where, no, it comes from certain places. You can pull it from places, right? Mm-hmm. It's neat. Yeah, it's really neat. And again, like you said, uh, consider you know with the the moon impacts water bending, so of course, kind of the sun would obviously impact the fire bending. It's you know really cool connections there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think about other stuff. Uh, by the way, we see Jet and his crew again. Yes. They never get a resolution. Like, Jet is basically dying, and we never get a resolution to that. I mean, I'm okay with that because, you know, like, Jet has his moment. He does the hero thing, and that's kind of it. Like, we don't need any more from him because I think. Most people would, you know, say like they were more interested in Jet because he's the one who had a lot of the character in the development already, and we didn't need much from the rest of his crew, per se, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's again, fine. I don't, think, I don't think we necessarily needed more or something, but uh, looking back at this, it's like, oh yeah, he's dying, and like it never gets. A, we never really know if he made it or not. If we know. It's like, and again, I, I don't he, really he's care. Dead, dead, right? I think that's the idea. Yeah, like I don't really care at the end of the day. I don't well, feel is... for this guy too much, but it's like. I mean, I I, I don't... guess a yes or no would have been nice. <laughs> I I don't disagree with you. I think we could have. Listen, as much as I love it, we probably could have sacrificed the Cave of Two Lovers episode for like a little bit more of mm. <clears throat> a, a jet, you know, like, like resolution deal going on there or some other stuff I even mean, as much as i love this cave two lovers it is very much like it's... probably the weakest episode of this season mm. maybe like it, it i think it would be between that at least for me it would be between that and the swamp i didn't much care for the swamp i'll admit like there's again fun stuff in both episodes i just talked about some of the fun stuff from this from but Some of like, the fun stuff from the swamp, but 
these are definitely what I feel are the weaker episodes. And it season. also kind of comes back to the entire, it's not that they are bad, it's just when you take into account the other episodes, it's they are not as good. They mm-hmm. still have good stuff in them, but they are not to okay. the same Again, level. Again, like we, we've, we've had this conversation before, right? It says something that even the weakest episodes of this entire series can still be considered good episodes, right? Yeah, like like I said, uh, I think I said it uh, previously, though it's in that there are shows who wish the their best episodes would be on par with this show's weakest weakest episodes. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to say anything. But... <laughs> <laughs> so that I mean... being said. That being said, I guess uh, there's no way, there's no point in delaying it. Should we get we're there? Gonna t- should we mention we're gonna, her? Well, I guess we should, you know. <laughs> Azula is the biggest bitch in animation history. <laughs> I think and this we was l- the first time that, yeah, everyone learned to hate a character and everyone agreed. Uh, but the, but here's the thing, you love to hate her. You mm-hmm. love that she's a bitch. She's, sh- she's, that's, and you know. For what we said earlier that, about Saka, you know that uh, he's that he, you know, he's he's a sexist, but you know he can learn from. Just enjoy the fact that this character has no redemption. She was a bitch from the moment she was born, and she loves being a bitch. I mean, it's also worth saying something, right? They brought another villain in after Zuko, and it's. Mm-hmm. I I I feel like. I could be wrong, but I feel like a lot of the there, there's probably a lot of doubt there. It's like, can this villain live up to what we already established with Zuko? Because we know Zuko's not going to stay the villain, right? As writers and everything, mm-hmm. there that's yeah. a big risk bringing in a brand new villain and saying, "Hey, this is going to be the big villain moving forward, not Zuko anymore," because we're doing well, a different direction. Kinda... I guess you could say that they always going to tease that uh, eventually the biggest villain is going to be Ozai. But, but you, Ozai stays but, in the background for a long time. Yeah, that's that's the thing, though. That you could always say that you know Zuko is kind of is is just kind of gonna be the villain until eventually we're gonna get to Ozai. Mm-hmm. That uh, like I guess if I have to compare this to something, Zuko is the Vader to Ozai's Emperor. True. No, that's fair. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's a very apt. Uh, description actually personally yeah um okay and honestly i just i forget the fact that they are also father and son okay let's also forget that so they're not father anywho. and son actually but anyways oh they're not. no they're not <laughs> well then i forgot some i forgot stuff about star wars considering it's the fair. only movie it's I, star the, wars uh, you know something if i may say the only star wars movie i've ever seen from beginning to end is rogue one and boy was that boring Agree to disagree. I did like Rogue One, but <laughs> uh, okay. Back to this though. But again, a kind of a Vader emp- Emperor sort of a thing that you know. Oh, no, that, fair, fair. Yeah, Zuko. Zuko is probably like the bigger villain because we face him more. But uh, and, but Oza is the one that we need to be careful from the most. Mm-hmm. And suddenly you bring in Azula, who she was teased in season one, like we saw her when. Uh, during the flashback, when Zuko got his car, we knew nothing and, about uh, her other than she smiled, right? Like she, she seems also, a little bit and, sadistic, but that's all we knew. And also, Zuko does mention to Angie in like the season one finale that you know he has a sister that was always kind of like the favorite, in a way, at least to at least to Ozai, she was the favorite. But that and to we, us as an audience, right? That means very little. We don't know if that yeah, means that's she's a, terrible but, or if she could, she could have changed and she's good. We we have no clue, nothing about Azula, right? Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you get to see her, and <clears throat> she's just dripping evil. She is dripping evil, and that is, and she like she's legit scary sometimes with how e- and with how much she loves well, being I mean, evil. We see her like, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, we see her in episode one immediately, right, where she's like, yeah, a- and her first scene is, you know, hey, a cap, you know, the ship captain coming up to tell her like, hey. We don't like. We're not going to be able to land the ship. You know, the waves will destroy the ship. It'll damage it, and we won't be able to go anywhere if we do. And she's like, "Hey, you know, is the is are the waves the captain of the ship?" And the captain's like, "I don't understand." And you have this entire scene of like, "Hey, figure it the fuck out," because the waves are. You already know the waves want to kill you. 
because they're going to kill you because it's just who they are, what the waves are and what the waves are going to do of the water. I'm still debating on whether or not I'm going to kill you. So land the ship. <laughs> and it's just like, damn, it's like, all right, let's go. Yeah, like and and uh, I was about to bring this up a bit <clears throat> that in this season we are learning another uh, part of uh, fire bending, lightning bending. Yeah, I think and episode one is the first with, time we ever see it. Yeah, uh, and that's what I'm saying. We're introduced to it this season. And uh, when Iro explains it to Zuko, he said that, you know, when you do this, you need to become, like, completely devoted of emotion. You need to, like, uh, you mm -hmm. are led, you're letting that control you. Yeah, In a way, kind of like water, and they also make the comparison that kind of like water bending, you have to let it flow through you in a way. Like, the and and then uh, you just release and just you know that uh, when when you have zuko who is pro who starts as the villain but you can tell that he just wants to do that you know to show to regain his honor mm -hmm. and so he can't really do it because he can't let go of that specific thing but then you have azula she can just lightning bend whenever the fuck she wants and like such an e such um and you know um simple and effective way to tell you this bitch is fucking dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it is also and, like again this and is, also you this know whatever she found down the entire path to towards potential redemption and like everything that goes on with him this entire season. And like, also let's uh, let's uh, not, let's not forget that whenever she fire bends, it's blue. Mm -hmm. Not red, not orange or red or whatever fire color you I think forget. fire is. So. They do explain why that is at some point, right? I forget. Uh, I if there is an expert, I think it's just because I always gonna saw it as because she, because the lightning bending is blue, so I always kind of figure that you know one when, when push comes to shove, you know the reason Hellfire is blue is because the lightning takes over. Possible. I don't I don't remember if they explained it or not. I can't remember. It's been a while. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but Azula is dangerous. And like, mm -hmm. also, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, an episode, I, I think it, it's called The Chase or something that, yeah, uh, well, basically, she's just chasing them all over. And eventually, it, it just comes down to this point where it's a uh, Ang, Katara, Toph, and, and you know, Iroh I think and Zuko. Zuko just, Iroh and yeah, Zuko as well. Like, I, everyone's I, there I, having Azula surrounded. Yeah. Yeah, and she is just laughing them off. She doesn't give a shit. She's taking on all of them. And it's a, this is one of those episodes where I was like, oh my god, I need a nap after this episode. Oh yeah, that was, like I, that was also the episode where Iro got wounded, and you're like, oh shit, is Iro gonna die? Fuck. <laughs> yeah, that, like, holy shit. Like, that was another one of those moments where the stakes rose a little bit, and you got a little bit worried, and you're like, oh fuck, what's gonna happen now? Just this season is insane with uh, how much uh, I think the chase is the episode story. that really set Azula and uh Mai and Tylee up, right? It's like, okay, no, these are villains, especially Azula, right? Like, that was mm -hmm. the episode you're like, oh like. shit. And that's another thing I kind of like that you know, she has her two friends, you know. I I forgot their names, friend, Mai and Tylee, friends, quote yeah. unquote. Yeah, a friend's quote unquote, but it's also like that it doesn't sound like she's necessarily using you can it sounds like that she does kinda like them, but also Well, it's it's great, right? Because you can see these moments of like going going back to like when she when we because it's episode three, Return to Amashu, when Azula starts, you know, gain when Azula starts gathering up Tylee and then she gets Mai at the end, right? You can literally see, which I love, this this thing of, like, because they're going to go in and trade uh, the fire, you know, the governor's baby from the Fire Nation for Boomy, right? And try and get Boomy back. Yes. And Boomy's like, no, no, no. But one of the things they do is Azula, it's like, hey, Mai, why are we trading a baby, your little brother, for Boomy? That makes no sense. We shouldn't do that. And you kind of just get this feeling of, like, there's just this quiet pause for just a brief bit. Of my just kind of standing there, and be like you know what, you're right, and then they try and kill Ang and everyone else, and don't trade Boomy for it. But it's like, that's your little brother. Why would you do that? But then you already had the scene previously of Azula getting Kylie, you know, to follow her and everything and go with her, and you immediately understand there's this thing of, oh shit, like 
Mai's pretty much forced to make that choice because if she doesn't, Azul is going to kill her or her baby brother regardless anyway. So it's either Mai makes the choice or Azula forces the choice, right? Like you can tell there's Azula likes these people, but also these people pretty much have to do what Azula says or they're kind of fucked. In yeah, the discussion. I, she likes like, them. It, it's a very warped they, friendship. Yeah, she likes them because they can't say no to her. Mm -hmm. And that's that's messed up. I mean, yeah, it's absolutely fucked up. But I mean again, and it, it I, sets up Azula do, more and more. Like you can see this warped yeah, friendship where she just, likes these people. She thinks they're great. And, and if I just want to say that, you know, uh, Azula's voice actress is Grey Delisle, and, mm. like, uh, regardless of her, uh, she, uh, from what I've seen in interviews and stuff, she seems like the sweetest person. Yeah, she's great. Like, she's lovely. Like, uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure if it's still relevant, but I know that for her Wikipedia page, that her profile picture is literally her holding a sign that says, my official Wikipedia picture. <laughs> like that is a person with a sense of humor. That is a person, and that is a person. And also, she's done a lot of voice work yes, for character. Has. Like you know, she she's. I think to this day, she's still Daphne in Scooby Doo, and um, what else? Um, she's and I know she was Vicky in in uh, Family Out Parents. I think um, Sam in Danny Phantom. Like she, her her IMDb page is quite long. Trust us on this. Yeah, so, like she's been voice and, acting for a while. Yeah, and uh, and like, but she is just she is completely losing herself when she's doing Azula, and she is fantastic in this role. Like, it, it, the, it, the, every time again, every time she speaks, evil just drips from her voice alone. It's wonderful how uh, how much she enjoys being evil. Mm hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I just kind of now I just kind of want her to go to the bank uh, and uh, just do, say good morning in Azula's voice and just see how the banker would react. Mm -hmm. Come on, that, that would be funny. That would be funny if a person just uh, hears Azula coming to the bank. Like, come on, <laughs> that, that, that would be fucking. Uh, that, would, that would be fucking terrifying. I would be terrified. I can tell you for certain. So, I guess. Um, I'm. I guess uh, the, anything else you want to talk about before we just gonna move into the finale? Because boy, is there stuff to say? Uh, no. I mean, I think we're ready to move on to that finale and kind of jump into it because it's a big one. Uh, so question. Let's start with a uh, with a small phrase. Did you also think that they were gonna uh, that they were gonna make uh, Katara and Zuko a thing watching that finale? Thinking back, I think thinking back originally, there was a thought of, hmm, I wonder if they're going to do like a love triangle sort of deal going on. And they kind of do a little bit, but they don't, it's, it's very, it's very, it's over very quick, right? Like, you know exactly where things are going to go immediately, very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. But like, at the moment though, it, it's something that I just never got I the idea I do remember a that... lot of people being like, yeah. upset. It was... It was a it was a ship, and you know mm -hmm. I, it was. People uh, still like, ship and, it. People still love it, yeah, which is like, fair. To be like to be honest, to, uh, uh, to believe it or not, this is uh, uh, believe it or not one of the reasons my fiance agrees to marry me is because we both thought it when it happened. That's fair. <laughs> True story, but <laughs> absolutely fair. <laughs> But okay, for the record, I won't say that I'm necess that I necessarily ship it as much. I, I because I think yeah, Ang and Katara being Endgame is like is the most logical choice. But for a moment, I'm like, you know what? If you actually decided to go this route, I wouldn't hate it. It's this episode and another one we get in season three where I understand exactly why people do ship it, and I fully uh -huh. I get it. I don't, seen, but I fully get it. Yeah, like, I want, at the end of the day, yeah, uh, Ang and Katara for the win, but uh, at the same time, I I get the idea, like, you know, if uh, if you want to do something unpredictable, I could have bought it. I could have completely bought mm -hmm. it. Agreed. Absolutely. Which makes the, which make, and also, like, uh, the fact that the Zuko starts the finale, you know, in a, you know, actually running a tea shop with Iroh, he actually smiles the guy 
for the first time in forever. It's our boy's yeah. happy. Yeah. And then and we take then, it all away from him. And then he and then Azula fucking gaslights him. And it's like, no. But Listen, again, it I, makes sense though for it, right? It's it's it perfect for Zuko. Because, yeah, it, no, that's the thing though. It's not that it, it doesn't feel false because um, because also she's his sister and she's a manipulative bitch. Of course she would know how to push his buttons. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it's a, and it's like no Zuko, you smiled. Don't do this. No, and you can like tell us when he does it. <laughs> and, and when he de and when he turns on them, like you can see that Iroh is devastated. No, like the thing Iroh says to him as well, like that was so heavy as well. I forget yeah. the exact line that Arrow that I Arrow the says, line, but, but yeah. That, but like he says some. I I just I just remember that it was like this was so fucking devastating. Mm -hmm. that if anything, uh, and then you know, so you have this very intense fight scene of oh, I remember loving like uh, I think it was Katara's entire fight going on for with this entire like episode, right? Like the fight mm -hmm. that she has, because I was like, damn, go Katara, like. That's the fucking yeah. waterbender. It's been a while since we've seen it. Let's go. Yeah, Being and also bad, uh, absolute uh, badass. And, and, like, I think, great. and I think I also said, you know, that you know, Katana is such a great character because on the one hand, she's like the the wise one. She's like the uh, in she's, a way she's she's the mom of the group, more or less. Let's yeah, be honest. she's the she's the yeah, she's the mom of the group. She uh, has but to then be. like <laughs> but then like, you know, mess with her and she will oh and she'll reap your ass a new one. Mm -hmm. Don't mess with Katala. And so every time you get to see her fight, it's always a treat. Mm -hmm. Especially when she really gets to go all out, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah, that client and that uh, final fight in this season finale is so good and then out of nowhere you like I still rem listen. It, it, it's 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 weird that I can uh, that there are very few moments in media, even ones that I really like, that I just remember my exact reaction when I saw that. Okay, when I when I whenever I say it again, I'm just brought back to that one time, right? And Azula sh killing Ang while he's in the Avatar state is one of them. <laughs> What is this disappointment? Mm, what do you, no, I'm what agreeing do? with you. Like, I, I'm, oh, okay. Keep going. Uh, You're good. <laughs> no, like because I just remember, you know, when, after they established, like, if you are killed in the Avatar state, you like uh, done. No more Avatar. The cycle is blo is broken, and then suddenly you see this, and it's like, fuck. You know, I just remember being there. Like, no, no way they did that. They can't. There has to be another season. No, no, they can't. No, no, they can't do. <laughs> no, no. I just remember I was losing my mind. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I no. was, I was losing it. And then you know when I saw that uh, Katara's, um, you know when Katara killed him with uh, that little uh, thing, battle she had, I was like, okay, so he's alive. So I'm like, wait, but does it count? Is the cycle not broken? Is the cycle still broken? What's gonna happen? What's oh yeah, gonna happen? I remember. There's so many questions. We had to wait a year for that shit too. Yeah, just about. That, that's the other, <laughs> we had to wait a fucking year. This, this ended until... in December of 2006, and we didn't get the next episode for season three until September of 2007. Almost a year. Yeah, that was that was gut wrenching, people. Like if you you'd have to be you you needed to be there to know it. Like mm -hmm. oh. There were so many questions, and you were, just, and in a way, you know, looking back, this is the other thing I want to bring up. In a way, you know, to these days when you know a lot of shows just go straight to streaming, and you know they end usually on this one cliffhanger for that you're supposed to live with for like a few months or a year or something. These days we kind of know it, but back then this was a shock. Mm -hmm. No show really did this. I mean, it, I, again, I come back to it. I think Avatar was a lot of firsts, but a lot of, especially for the West, right? Like a lot of firsts and a lot of, like a lot of shows nowadays look at Avatar and pull from that. Like Avatar did a lot of, you know, walking so a lot of other shows could run, right? In my opinion, for a lot of different reasons. I think that's great. I think that's fine. I love that. 
I think we all do. That's what makes it so great of a show to look back at. Yeah. And because again, I uh, we talked last uh, last week about how you know about how in- influential Avatar was and you can still see it in a lot of ways, you know. Mm-hmm. You could argue maybe not the best of ways because now every season needs a cliffhanger of some kind that they drag you with. But it's like it was done so effectively back then. Like I still, again, I still remember watching it. Thinking, what? What? No, no, you can't leave here. No, no. When's the next season? No, uh, no. It's a, and even now, when I know what's gonna happen, I am still shocked. Mm-hmm. It's still, it's such an impactful moment. Yep. It's I'm, and it, again, and it's great because again, they give you all that information to leave you guessing like that it's great because it's so well set up because you have all this information you've learned all these new things and you have the information from season one and just all this stuff kind of sits there and then it's like boom here's the ending figure it out we'll see you in a bit and you have no clue in a bit yeah (laughs) uh, that bit is debatable but But, like again though it's it's so well set up for for it to be a cliffhanger and plus again like for the longest time, our good guys haven't felt like they've been on the down foot. It felt it's felt for like quite some while, especially after we defeated the Dai Li and everything, the kind of minor mm-hmm. villain of this season, where our, yeah. all right, we're moving up, everything's gonna working out great. You know, we're preparing for the the invasion during the um the eclipse and everything. Like everything's going great. And we're not gonna have to deal with Zuko anymore. It seems like he's done. They're, you know, him and his uncle are gonna live a great life. And all of a sudden, no, shit's bad, really bad. In yeah. fact, yeah. Like, like how do like, they come ha, back ha, from no. this? They they've lost the the biggest Earth Kingdom city in the entire world has fallen to the Fire Nation now. Like Ba Sing Se has finally fallen. It's been taken over. The thing that has basically stood as the one obstacle to the Fire Nation for you know, a long period of time, even when Iroh was in the army and during the war and everything, right? So, but now mm-hmm. it's fallen. Now all this stuff has changed. It's great. It's such uh, good yeah, setup. Yeah, everything, it, it's such an, it's such an impactful finale, but not just because it's like, okay, season two finale, we need to go big. We need to go, you know, we need to live up to the previous finale. It's just, it hits you in a different way. It's not just a big climax that and, you're like, whoa, this is cool. You like, there were circumstances to everything and you are not and you are literally not you are left with enough so that you can you can maybe theorize in your head what's gonna happen but you have no fucking clue what's gonna happen after that you and you are left with it and it sticks with you i I also i I think we should do this right (laughs) I, i guess weird that i'm gonna say this you know planning for you know next episode a little bit but i i really think it'd be interesting to compare and contrast after we've done it now avatar you know the first season of avatar and everything or not the first season but like the first avatar show with the dragon prince a little bit because it is the same creators right yeah i think like i i really do think right and and i would love to be a fly on the wall to know kind of why their decisions some of the decisions that were made with the dragon prince but Something that I keep coming back to with Avatar and doing this rewatch and everything is that I look at the Dragon Prince and it feels like our heroes are almost always on the uptick, but it feels like we need them to not be on the uptick. So we have to let them get in their own way, essentially, and ruin themselves. Whereas here I look at this, I find it so fascinating, right, that, you know, they came from this where the heroes weren't the reason that they failed. Like they've created good villains that are very interesting and very enjoyable. And I know a lot of people compare Claudia and Azula, and that's something I always look at and go, really? Okay. Uh, and again, I, I, maybe yeah, they can uh, win me over with the next season of Dragon Prince when we get it, right? But it's so fascinating to see I this, where they came compare, from. I think people compare because ver- because Varian is kind of the Ozai, so of course. I get it. I get why they but, do it. I just don't think it's an apt comparison, personally. No, no, I agree with you, right? I totally get you, but it's all because it's also like, okay, so uh, based on that logic, Soren is like Zuko because he's the son of the bad guy who turns good, but also 
if you put Soren and Zuko together, Zuko would probably fight the guy and won't like him at all. So, eh. Uh, but here's the thing about the Dragon Prince. I think to I think to some extent they had it going for the first three seasons. I agree. It's when suddenly they had to make four more when they lost track. Well, I think a lot of it comes from we had because if I'm not mistaken, right, this third season is basically when we've defeated Viren and like w w you know, uh, fuck, I forget the little dragon's name. It's been a while. Zim. Zim, like he's back and everything, and things have worked out, right? Like we've got this nice thing going on now. It wasn't perfect, but our heroes won the day. And after that point, our big, supposedly big villains were essentially on the back foot for a long time, and it just never made sense. Here, yeah. even though Zuko and Iroh kind of lost, and the Fire Nation did lose at the, um, at the Southern Water Tribe and everything, like they did lose that fight and everything, it never felt like everything was lost for our bad guys. And our, our bad guys never felt like they were on the back foot. It still yeah. felt like our bad guys had things they could do and were able to like you know move around and had still more resources to go and use and all that yada yada in the dragon prince it's just i don't know right it's one of those things of I tell our bad you guys what, have nothing and they feel like it feels like they're kind of the good guys all of a sudden because they're the ones yeah. who are the, like the plucky underdogs what, and it's just interesting, weird interestingly it feels like if okay i tell you what if Season, if the first three seasons of Dragon Prince are Avatar The Last Airbender, then seasons four to seven, which again, at the time of this recording, only five, only season five aired. We still have two more seasons to mm -hmm. go. We're waiting. But it, but it feels like seasons four and five are like a prologue to that, to a sequel show that uh, that is uh, that is that still needs to get going. Possible. It's just a it's it's a weird change up, right? Of going yeah. from our villains are on the uptick, our villains are doing all these things, our villains have been beaten. Now our villains are basically the plucky underdogs who you don't actually want to root for, but the good guys are getting in their own way so much and you kind of do want to root for them. <laughs> yeah, because it's also because it's also weird that it because on the one hand. I don't think they were supposed to... Maybe there was supposed to be, like, one more season after season three, but it also feels like we are suddenly in a new story that is not connected much at all because there, there's a time skip for one and there are a lot mm -hmm. more. And, and, like, again, like you said, it's like the heroes need to shoot themselves in the foot for the bad guys to have a chance. It's so weird. It's definitely an odd one, especially coming from Avatar. Like, it's... Yeah. I want to sure. like I I love Not these sure creators. I think they do great things, right? It's just weird. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. blows my mind as I think of like you created this, and it's like this was good. I didn't hate this. I still don't hate it. It's just weird the direction you've taken it in, and I'm yeah, not sure remember, it works. I remember our season five review of the <laughs> I, Dragon Prince was mm -hmm. basically it's basically just an hour or something of us going. We are not mad. We are disappointed. Yes, pretty much. But again, like, you know, I have faith in these creators. when they just creators. ninja drop the fucking thing, I still can't... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. But I mean, comprehend that. <laughs> it's Netflix at this point. I'm kind of used to it. But it, it is one of those things of, I still have faith in these creators. I do think they can do good stuff because this exists. And this is one of the one of the best things I think exists, right? In terms of, like, yeah. a, show, a cartoon show that has been put out. Very little top Avatar, I in my stand, opinion. I stand, I stand by it. Avatar: The Last Airbender is probably the closest to perfection a show could get, especially coming from Nickelodeon. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know something? It's also kind of funny to say uh, to think that you know, oh, you know, Nickelodeon. It's the SpongeBob guys. What the hell? Is it? Like, have you seen Avatar: The Last Airbender? No. At the same time, though, if you think that nowadays, I I, I understand. I think that's all they have. <laughs> Does what, Nickelodeon uh, put out anything that's interesting in a while? You know, like I'm going to shit Ninja on Nickelodeon Turtles? for a bit. I guess Ninja Turtles, yeah. But other than that, like Ninja but, Turtles. But at the same time, also, also though, it's not, a, a, this is an IP they acquired. It's not an true. IP that they created. True, true. So to be fair. 
Um, I'm trying to think though if there's anything because again, I think m most of the stuff that they put out is just that trying to find the next SpongeBob while they still milk him to the ground. Which, to be honest, SpongeBob did get better from what I've heard. But... Yeah, SpongeBob's doing fine from what I understand. Like he was doing fine, and now he's getting better. Right, the show is and stuff they're doing with that, but like you know, it still sucks that the... Avatar has the... been left like... here to languish off to the side. It's like Cora wasn't uh, terrible. Know... Cora was good. That's the thing, though. You know that now we have Avatar Studios, right? I've heard of it, but nothing has happened as far as I'm aware. So well, like... because they have a lot of stuff that's in development. Ah, you okay. just need to wait and see. Because I know that there is something planned, like with, you know, an adult team Avatar movie. Like, you know, an adult and Katara. Not adult that it's R-rated or something, but like that it's them in their later years. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know there are there are other stuff. I mean, it's Hollywood. Planned. It might also be R rated. Who knows? It's Nickelodeon uh, it's as the, well. Who knows at this point? The, They've the done the series so dirty. <laughs> it's the original creators, so I want to hold on hope, but at the same time, I also know that if Nickelodeon tells them, "Hey, make a make a sh make a movie where Ang and Cora meet," it's like it doesn't make sense canonically, but make it work. Listen, it's. Like, that's the problem, right? Like, we have to sit back and say this because Nickelodeon has consistently, for Avatar The Last Airbender and Korra, done these people dirty both times yeah. <laughs> for mm -hmm. both shows. And it's like, uh, uh, we can't know, we trust getting, you. <laughs> and actually, we are getting a new show about the Avatar after Korra. Called... Which I'm all for. I, I, yeah, I, I want to see new I'm Avatar all. stuff. I love this world. I love the thing they have built. I want to see new stuff. But I always but, you know, worry whenever I, think... I know they're making a new one because it's like, are you going to fuck it up in some way? Because you've consistently I, I, fucked we remember, we, rem we remember Korra. And again, I still enjoy Korra for the I record, love Korra. I think Korra's great. But we can't can deny, see... right? You can see where they, they screwed them hard. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, if you would have left them alone and just let them do their thing, this would have been way better than what it was. I'll and it still was right good. Off the but... bat, I'll, tell them, I'll tell them right off the bat that they were doing four seasons and now just be, hey, it's only one season. Mm -hmm. Walk, and it's like, oh, actually, you're getting more. Make it work. <laughs> Bye. Mm hmm. And it's uh, like... Well, so anything else about sure. book two of The Last Airbender? Because Listen, I think we've had uh, a little bit of a, a negative thing here, but it wasn't towards the Avatar. It was towards Nickelodeon and a little bit of the Dragon Prince because. My, why not shots fired <laughs> but <laughs> but no like avatar season two is a great like sequel sometimes you know great generation. definitely definitely a strong content uh, definitely a strong continuation to the first one and it says and something right I because still... season one was so good like they had a lot to live up to and they surpassed it uh, yeah they surpassed it and you know they left us with still, I'd argue, one of the most intense cliffhanger you could mm -hmm. ever end a season on. Again, I still, every time I, every time I see it again, I still go back to that one day after school when I was like, "Fuck," you know. <laughs> yep, I get you. I feel that. I think but, a lot of people uh, did back then. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, but uh, like we said, you won't have to wait a year for us to cover book three because. Well, um, wait for next week. Yeah, and we'll find out. Did season three manage to capitalize on that cliffhanger? Did season three manage to do just as well, if not better, than season two? Spoiler warning: It did do very Spoilers. well, but but you know you probably know that if you're listening <laughs> to this. So, with that being said, that's all for this episode of the Outcast. We hope you enjoyed it. What do you think about Avatar: The Last Airbender Book Two? You can tell us all about, and I guess you know about Nickelodeon and how they handle this franchise and Dragon Prince. I suppose listen to our Dragon Prince reviews; they're hilarious. You can tell us all about it in the comment section below on our Twitter, which is Bearcast with capital B, capital C, and on our Tumblr, which is Bearcast D. So until book three, I was HC. I was Wolf. And we will see you all next time. Take care. Bye bye.